Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is April 30, 2022. And a couple of weeks ago, I came across this article. April 8, 2022, woman arrested in Starr County on murder charge for, quote, illegal abortion. The article goes on to say that the woman in question, Lizelle Herrera, age 26, was arrested and served with an indictment, quote, on the charge of murder after Herrera did then and there intentionally and knowingly cause the death of an individual by self-induced abortion. Her arrest came as Texas, of course, enacted one of the strictest abortion laws in the country last year in SB 8, which encourages private citizens to sue individuals or organizations that help people get an abortion after six weeks of gestation. The law is currently being contested in court. So I saw this article and it reminded me of a few things, such as how in some countries where abortion is completely illegal, women are even jailed over miscarriages because the you know, right-wing zealots claim that, oh, it's not a miscarriage, you knowingly induced it, when that actually may not be the case at all. But anyway, I had been wanting to cover this article, and then in the last video, What Did Lenin Think of Populism, Part 2, which was in part a response to Infracell's comments about abortion, in which he took the absurd position that communists should not, quote, die on the hill of abortion rights, even though this is a basic human right, abortion is health care, it's a working class issue affecting many women, and just, I don't even know what else to say. But it's time, I guess, to have a discussion about abortion rights in the United States, the history, where they're headed, etc., But make no mistake, this is absolutely an issue that a Marxist of any stripe should be supporting. We want abortions to be easily accessible, as inexpensive as possible, or free. And every time that there is a right-wing attack on women's health care, which is absolutely where this is coming from, we, socialists, need to stand up and say, no, fuck you right-wing. And also, fuck you to the fake socialist right-wingers who say, oh, we're going to cave on this issue because it's, quote, not a hill to die on, even though an overwhelming majority of the population supports these rights and the attacks are being driven by the religious right primarily. Fringe, minority nutcases who are anti-worker. So we're going to come back around to the story of Lizelle Herrera because there are more recent updates from just this week. But before we do that, let's get some background on this issue. We're going to read some articles from Planned Parenthood and from Amnesty. And let's start by examining the far right that is driving these attacks. We have two examples here. First, showing that this is nothing new. Here's an article from 2005 from Media Matters. The headline is, Religious Conservatives Claim Katrina, that was Hurricane Katrina, was God's omen and punishment for the United States. The article reads, In the wake of Hurricane Katrina, some religious conservatives have speculated that the storm was sent by God as an omen or as a punishment for America's alleged sins. Media Matters for America has documented such statements from three religious conservative media figures, Pat Robertson, Hal Lindsey, and Charles Colson. Here we're just going to talk about Pat Robertson, former Republican presidential candidate. Pat Robertson. Katrina linked to legalized abortion. On the September 12 broadcast of the Christian Broadcasting Network's The 700 Club, comment, you may remember The 700 Club being mentioned in an earlier video on this channel. It was one of the sources that Russell Brand was citing in his support for the Canadian truck convoy. Continuing, host Reverend Pat Robertson, founder of the Christian Coalition of America and a former Republican presidential candidate, linked Hurricane Katrina and terrorist attacks to legalized abortion. Quoting Robertson, You know, it's just amazing, though, that people say that the litmus test for Supreme Court nominee John G. Roberts Jr. is whether or not he supports the wholesale slaughter of unborn children. Yeah, that's how they put it. We have killed over 40 million unborn babies in America. I was reading yesterday a book that was very interesting about what God has to say in the Old Testament about those who shed innocent blood. And he used the term that those who do this, quote, the land will vomit you out. That you look at your, you look at the book of Leviticus, or not, and see what it says there, or don't. And the author of this said, well, vomit out means that you're not able to defend yourself. 
but we have found we are unable somehow to defend ourselves against some of the attacks that are coming against us, either by terrorists or now by natural disaster. Could they be connected in some way? Comment. Or, you know, could the government policy of people living on this earth, not a god, have anything to do with it? Continuing. And he goes down the list of things that God says will cause a nation to lose its possession and to be vomited out. And the amazing thing is, a judge has now got to say, I will support the wholesale slaughter of innocent children in order to get confirmed to the bench. And I'm sure that Judge Roberts is not going to say any such thing. But nevertheless, that's the litmus test that's being put on the very thing that could endanger our nation. And it's very interesting. Read the Bible, read Leviticus, see what it says there. Unquote, or don't. So that was, you know, 17 years ago. Now, just this week, we have another reactionary Republican politician who claims to have found the source of all the abortions. Who's telling women to get these abortions? Could it be Satan? Well, according to Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, yes, Satan manipulates women into getting abortions. Quote, it's whispered softly and gently into your ears and into your soul. The Congresswoman said in a TV interview with Catholic activist Michael Voris this week, and let me tell you, Catholic activists, if there's one thing that they're really good and progressive on, it's issues relating to sexuality, reproductive health. No. The Georgia representative said that Satan tells women it's okay to get an abortion, and exchange promises them, quote, all these dreams that you have in your heart. And that's how Satan sells a sin, and that's how he sells abortion. He tells a woman that all you have to do is you're just going to go to this clinic, just going to get it over with, you know, she said. Quote, and then you're going to that guy, he's going to stay with you, that boyfriend or the guy, whoever he is, he's going to marry you, sweep you off your feet, unquote. So this is the kind of discourse that is being fostered by the right wing in the United States. It's not evidence-based in any way. It doesn't have anything to do with health. It doesn't have anything to do with social outcomes. It's informed by superstition and religious ignorance and bigotry. So let's turn now to some facts about abortion in the U.S. We're going to go to our article from Amnesty International. This is titled, Abortion Laws in the U.S., 10 Things You Need to Know, from June 11, 2019. In 2019, several U.S. states have passed laws which effectively ban abortion, and others have taken steps to drastically restrict abortion access. Here are 10 key facts about this frightening crackdown on reproductive rights, and it is frightening. 1. This has been a long time coming. In 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that abortion was legal in the landmark case Roe v. Wade. Anti-choice activists and politicians have been working to overturn this decision, ever since, and we're now seeing the fruits of that labor. The attacks on Roe also ramped up when President Trump appointed two new judges to the Supreme Court, both of whom have expressed anti-choice views. But it's important to recognize that the law is not the only factor that determines whether people can access abortions. Since 1973, anti-choice activists have been steadily chipping away at abortion access. They have done this partly by creating financial and logistical barriers, which make it difficult or impossible for people to get abortions, despite what the law says. 2. It's already hard for many people to get abortions in the U.S. Take Alabama as an example. In May, Alabama's governor signed into law a draconian bill that could punish doctors who perform abortions with life in prison. But in practice, abortion is already inaccessible for many people in Alabama. The Guttmacher Institute found that in 2014, 93% of Alabama counties had no clinics that provided abortions. This means that many people in Alabama have to travel to other states to access abortions. Even then, many people simply cannot afford to end their pregnancies. This is because Alabama, like many other states, does not include abortion in the list of health care services that people with low incomes can access through Medicaid, government-assisted health insurance. Currently, all states have to provide public funding for abortions in cases of rape, incest, or threat to life, but in many places, these exemptions will be irrelevant if harsh new laws come into effect. 3. There are nowhere near enough abortion clinics in the U.S. There are six states in the U.S. which have only one clinic providing abortion. 27 major U.S. cities and much of rural America qualify as abortion deserts, 
where most people live more than 100 miles away from an abortion provider. One way that anti-choice activists force essential services out of existence is through targeted regulation of abortion providers, also known as TRAP laws, T-R-A-P. TRAP laws are unnecessary licensing requirements, which can make it difficult for abortion service providers to stay open. For example, state authorities might specify how wide the corridors can be in a building where doctors carry out abortions, the size of parking spaces, or how far away from schools the premises must be. These requirements have nothing to do with patient safety. Instead, they're used as a way to put so much pressure on abortion services that they're forced to close. 4. Some states have effectively banned all abortions. Alabama's new law bans all abortion from the time that, quote, a woman is known to be pregnant, with no exceptions. This is the harshest law yet. Five states, Georgia, Ohio, Kentucky, Mississippi, and Louisiana, have passed bills which prohibit abortion after about six weeks, before many people even realize that they are pregnant. And the next article that we're going to do is going to get into those six-week bans a little bit more. Again, that was the situation in Texas, the article that we started this off with. Five. But it's not just outright bans that we're worried about. According to the Guttmacher Institute, 42 abortion restrictions were enacted between 1st of January and 15th of May 2019 alone. This includes measures like prohibiting certain common types of procedure and requiring parental consent for teenagers who need abortions. 6. These new laws will cause deaths and injuries. Anti-abortion laws do not stop or reduce abortions, but they do make them dangerous. Let me repeat that. Anti-abortion laws do not stop or reduce abortions, but they do make them dangerous. When carried out with the assistance of a trained health care provider in sanitary conditions, abortions are one of the safest medical procedures available. But when abortions are restricted or criminalized, people are forced to seek unsafe ways to end pregnancies. Worldwide, an estimated 5 million women are hospitalized each year for treatment of abortion-related complications, and about 47,000 women die. The U.S. has the highest maternal mortality rate of any developed nation, and states with more restrictive abortion laws already have higher rates of both infant and maternal mortality. That's why these new laws are a recipe for disaster for women's health. 7. These laws are discriminatory. People with low incomes teenagers, people of color, migrants, and refugees are hardest hit by abortion restrictions because it is more difficult for them to pay, travel, or take time off work. African American women are three or four times more likely to die in pregnancy or childbirth than white women in the U.S., and this shameful inequality will likely be entrenched by new laws making pregnancy more dangerous. These laws are also another blow to LGBTI people who have suffered a sustained attack on their rights under the Trump administration. Trans people in the U.S. already face huge barriers to accessing reproductive health care, and this raft of new laws will further exclude them. 8. Trump's anti-abortion agenda, and, you know, of course, this isn't just Trump, it's the entire Jesus camp wing of the Republican Party, along with other scattered interests here and there. That agenda doesn't just affect people in the U.S. In 2017, President Trump reinstated and expanded a policy called the Global Gag Rule. This rule states that any overseas organization which receives U.S. global health funding cannot even mention abortion as part of their counseling or education programs, even if the money for these particular programs doesn't come from the U.S. Even if providers think that a pregnancy will put a woman's health at risk, they cannot tell her that abortion is an option or direct her to a safe provider. A recent study found that this policy is making a broad range of services less accessible, including contraceptive services, HIV AIDS testing and treatment, cervical cancer screening, and support for survivors of gender-based violence. 9. 73% of Americans want abortion to remain safe and legal. The lawmakers putting these extreme restrictions on abortion access do not represent the views of most U.S. Americans. An independent poll released in January 2019 found that two-thirds of Americans think abortion should be legal in all or most cases, and 73% are opposed to overturning Roe v. Wade. 10. The fight is not over. None of the abortion bans passed this year has yet taken effect, and abortion is still legal in all 50 states as of 11 June 2019. The ACLU, the Planned Parenthood Action Fund, and others 
have vowed to fight back, and lawsuits have already been filed in several states. On the 31st of May, Planned Parenthood won a court order to keep Missouri's only abortion clinic open on the day it was due to close. Kentucky's six-week bill has been temporarily blocked. Previously, similar bills have been struck down as unconstitutional in states including Iowa and North Dakota. In May, thousands of people took part in coordinated rallies, calling on states to hashtag stop the bans, and people all over the world continue to raise their voices in defense of reproductive rights. For more information on why access to abortion is a human right, see Key Facts on Abortion. So that's the end of that article, and we're not going to look at that particular one that they just suggested. However, we are going to turn to Planned Parenthood. This is a page called Bans on Abortion at Six Weeks. In state after state since 2019, anti-abortion politicians have moved to ban abortion at six weeks of pregnancy, a point before many people even know that they're pregnant. In the state of Texas, such a ban has gone into effect, imposing one of the most extreme abortion bans this country has ever seen. The politicians behind these bans have one goal, to push abortion out of reach, outlawing it in all but name. Banning abortion at six weeks makes it physically impossible to obtain. These bans make it both medically and logistically impossible for most people to determine that they're pregnant and arrange for safe, legal abortion care in time to beat the six-week deadline. For most people, six-week bans would stop access to abortion a mere two weeks after a missed period. It's no surprise why doctors oppose six-week abortion bans. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, ACOG, confirms that pregnant people are often unaware that they're pregnant before the six-week mark from their last period. Not yet knowing you're pregnant is one of many reasons that most surgical abortions take place after the six-week mark. Other reasons include needing time to save up money for the procedure and associated costs, such as traveling to the provider, taking time off of school or work, lodging, and child care. A substantial majority of people who have abortions are already mothers. The narrow health exceptions written into some six-week abortion bans simply do not adequately allow physicians to exercise their medical judgment to protect pregnant people's health in all circumstances. As ACOG notes, many complications that threaten pregnant people's health can't be detected until later in pregnancy, so taking away access to abortion could lead to serious complications and even maternal mortality. Attempts to ban abortion at six weeks have surged. While the Texas abortion ban is the first of its kind to go into effect, six-week abortion bans are nothing new. In 2011, Ohio politicians introduced the nation's first six-week ban. They have since proposed multiple similar bills. Ohio's initial attempts never went into effect, but they paved the way for other states to push equally dangerous copycat laws. North Dakota was the first state to enact a ban on abortion at six weeks in 2013. Iowa became the second in 2018. Courts blocked both laws for being unconstitutional, but the six-week bans have kept coming, and their numbers have skyrocketed. Mississippi enacted a six-week ban in 2019, but a federal court blocked it from going into effect. Kentucky, Ohio, and Georgia also enacted six-week bans in 2019. Federal courts blocked all of them from going into effect. Politicians in many other states, including Florida, Illinois, Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, Minnesota, Missouri, New York, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, and West Virginia have introduced or considered six-week bans. And here, I'm just going to depart from this article for a minute. We'll come back and finish it. But there is from another page on Planned Parenthood more of a highlight about the particular details of the six-week abortion bans in different states. So, as shown on the screen, six-week abortion bans. In state after state since 2019, anti-abortion politicians have moved to ban abortion, either outright or at a point before many people even know they're pregnant. These six unconstitutional bans have been signed into law, but are not currently in effect. Alabama, a couple of bullet points, banned abortion from the time a person is, quote, known to be pregnant. No exceptions for rape and incest. State could investigate miscarriages. We're going to go into detail on that. It's the most punitive ban signed since Roe v. Wade was decided. Doctors could be charged with a Class A felony and sentenced to up to 99 years in prison. About Alabama, it has the highest cervical cancer mortality rate in the U.S. and the fourth worst infant mortality rate in the U.S. In Georgia, 
There was a bill banning abortion at six weeks. The state could investigate miscarriages again, and doctors could be sentenced to up to 10 years in prison. Georgia has the second worst maternal mortality rate in the U.S., 10 times higher than California. Half of Georgia counties do not have a single OBGYN. In Kentucky, bill banning abortion at six weeks. It criminalizes providers and is currently under challenge in court. In Mississippi, again, bans abortion at six weeks, no exceptions for rape and incest. It's currently before the U.S. Supreme Court in a case that presents the first direct challenge to Roe v. Wade since Justice Amy Coney Barrett's confirmation. In Missouri, bill banning abortion at eight weeks with no exceptions for rape and incest. And let me just comment about the no exceptions for rape and incest. The people getting pregnant in these cases, victims of rape and incest, are these often people with a high degree of agency in their daily lives? Not necessarily if they are in a situation like that. Just one reason of many why this is an inhuman provision. The state could investigate miscarriages. Doctors could be sentenced to up to 15 years in prison. The maternal mortality rate is 50% higher than the U.S. Congenital syphilis is at its highest rate in nearly two decades. And five counties in Missouri face a 1,000% increase in syphilis. In Ohio, the bill was banning abortion at six weeks with no exceptions for rape and incest. Doctors could be sentenced to up to one year in prison. It also defunded Healthy Moms, Healthy Babies, a program that worked to reduce maternal and infant mortality. So again, when they talk about, you know, we're killing unborn babies, this and that, how about the living babies? You know, the ones that come to term and then die. No, you're going to defund that. You're also going to defund the health care for the parents bringing them to term, which obviously has direct impact on the infant health and survival rate. Yeah, it has nothing to do with that at all, the political push to do this. Nothing whatsoever. Obviously, they don't care about you. These are the same people who are the staunchest opponents of universal health care, etc. Continuing, Ohio introduced a bill requiring sex educational materials to, quote, clearly and consistently state that abortion kills a living human being, and it stripped Violence Against Women Act funds from Planned Parenthood. So... That's the kind of monstrous shit going on in these bills. Let's get back to the main article. Some of these bills criminalize abortion providers and would keep pregnant people from accessing abortion in instances of rape and incest without exceptions. Other six-week bans, like the one in Georgia, would require any patient seeking an abortion to undergo a medically unnecessary transvaginal ultrasound and would require sexual assault survivors to obtain and provide an official police report. And I guess hope that it wasn't a cop who assaulted you. Moreover, the Georgia bill would subject all people who experience the termination of a pregnancy at six weeks or later to criminal liability, exposing anyone who has a miscarriage to the risk of criminal charges. Politicians in Texas wrote that state's six-week ban, known as SB8, to encourage vigilantes, literally. An unprecedented provision within the Texas ban emboldens ordinary citizens to enforce it. In fact, The abortion ban offers a cash incentive to people who file lawsuits against someone they think is breaking the law, establishing an award of at least $10,000 for every lawsuit that successfully blocks a pregnant person from getting an abortion in Texas. Since SB 8 contains no upper limit on the number of lawsuits, anyone who provides or helps a patient obtain an abortion in Texas could face a rush of suits from organized anti-abortion activists. Efforts to ban abortion at six weeks mean that politicians want a Supreme Court fight. The Supreme Court was clear in Roe v. Wade that states cannot ban abortion. So why would politicians flout well-settled precedent and put patients and doctors at risk in the process? Because they want to overturn Roe v. Wade. Several six-week bans already face lawsuits, and that's just what the politicians behind them want. They want a challenge to our constitutional right to safe, legal abortion that reaches the Supreme Court. With Trump appointees Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Coney Barrett, and others who have track records of opposing abortion access, now in lifetime positions on the Supreme Court and lower federal courts, politicians pushing these bans believe that time and the judiciary may well be on their side. Six-week abortion bans are dangerous, extreme, and unconstitutional. U.S. Americans support safe, legal abortion blocking access to reproductive health care through measures like six-week abortion bans and ignoring clear Supreme Court precedent in the process requires zealous ideological commitment. 
but politicians' motivation is clear. They seek to mobilize the small minority of voters who want to ban abortion nationwide. In pushing these bans, anti-abortion politicians are ignoring the vast majority of people in the United States who support the right to access abortion without political interference. In fact, 79% of Americans say that they don't want to see Roe v. Wade overturned. Who gets hurt if abortions beyond six weeks are banned? Abortion is such a common medical procedure that six-week bans will hurt many of us. Every day, people across the U.S. face the deeply personal decision of whether or not to continue their pregnancies. Nearly one in four women in the U.S. has an abortion during her lifetime. But like all restrictions on safe and legal abortion, banning abortion at six weeks burdens low-income people the most. Such bans would force people to go to extreme and costly lengths to access abortion safely and legally. When safe, legal abortion providers are hundreds of miles and many hours away, people with low incomes struggle to reach the care that they need, if they can get it at all. Women who can't access abortion are three times more likely to end up below the federal poverty line. For many people, these barriers effectively ban abortion. And women of color, who already face significant barriers to health care and attacks on their bodily autonomy, bear the brunt. Black, Hispanic, and Native American women experience poverty at more than twice the rate of non-Hispanic white women and may lack the financial resources or job flexibility to make these trips. The cost of transportation, child care, and time off of work necessary to obtain an abortion can combine to put access out of reach. This is hardest on people who already face barriers to accessing health care, including people of color, immigrants, young people, people with disabilities, women, LGBTQ people, people living in rural areas, and people with low incomes. Women of color are already less likely to be able to access an abortion. Racism and other systemic barriers have contributed to income inequality that makes black people and Latinos in the United States more likely to use federally funded insurance to access health care. Though 15 states allow the state portion of Medicaid to fund all or most necessary abortions. Millions of women live in states that ban public funding of abortion, with few exceptions. And in some states, legislators have also used cultural misinformation to craft restrictions to target Asian American women's access to abortion. Women of color also have less access to contraception, leading to more unintended pregnancies. Among other reasons, Latino women and non-Hispanic black women are less likely to have access to family planning services, which can result in significantly lower rates of effective contraceptive use. Limited access to health insurance and contraception can both contribute to heightened rates of unintended pregnancies and sexually transmitted infections. The bottom line, banning abortion at six weeks is unconstitutional and unsafe. Abortion is health care. Every person deserves to access it. The decision to have an abortion should be left up to the pregnant person in consultation with their doctor and family, not a politician. Comment, you know, I this was, I think, a pretty good piece so far. I'm not sure why they put doctor and family. Not sure that the and family part belongs in there, but anyway, continuing. Six-week abortion bans are dangerous attacks on reproductive health and rights, and they reflect an ideology out of touch with what the majority of U.S. Americans want from political leaders. So... I mean, that's the end of the article. Obviously, what U.S. Americans want from political leaders is not really an issue. We know that from the Princeton study on democracy. Public opinion has no statistical effect on public policy. However, donor opinion, capitalist opinion, in other words, does have significant effect. So that is the fight that's going on in the U.S. Before we get back to Lizette, let's go to an article from The Conversation. This is from April 11, 2018, titled The Unspeakable Cruelty of El Salvador's Abortion Laws. This is, in other words, the situation we don't want to get to in any more countries. Around the world today, we're seeing two opposite tendencies in abortion law reform. In the Americas, the governments of Bolivia, Chile, and Mexico City recently lifted total bans on abortion. Other jurisdictions, such as Ohio, several states in Mexico and Poland have passed or attempted tighter restrictions. Even Doug Ford, the leader of Ontario's Progressive Conservative Party, huh, has voiced openness to making abortion more difficult to access. In El Salvador, the clock is ticking towards a May 1, 2018 deadline for reform that would decriminalize abortion in two situations, when the life of the pregnant woman is in danger and when an underage girl, but not an adult woman, 
becomes pregnant through rape. The attention of the world's media was recently drawn to this country's extreme abortion regime by the commutations of the 30-year prison sentences of two Salvadoran women. Their crime was to have had a miscarriage, and a miscarriage, for those who don't know, is basically losing the baby. The pregnancy fails, the body rejects the fetus, and the pregnancy is over. It's different from a stillbirth, at least in the U.S., a miscarriage is defined as up to 20 weeks, and a stillbirth is after 20 weeks. It's closer to there is a birth process, but the baby is born dead. However, when we're talking about 20 weeks, that's basically four and a half or five months. It's like halfway through a pregnancy. But when we talk about premature births, the earliest category, like very early premature births, is up to 32 weeks. So, I mean, if you go back 12 weeks from 32, we're talking about, you know, an extremely early birth. Uh, for some reason, this is still counted as a stillbirth, however. Anyway, continuing. Both innocent women had served over a decade of their sentences. To understand what's at stake, we need to look at what makes El Salvador probably the worst country on earth to have an unwanted or life-threatening pregnancy or a complicated miscarriage, especially if you're poor. I am a sociologist who has researched healthcare policy in El Salvador, including the expansion of healthcare services to the poor by the left of center Farabundo Marti National Liberation Front, FMLN government. As an admirer of this government's goals and achievements in healthcare, I'm struck by a contradiction. It has made genuine efforts to reduce maternal mortality, but during most of its nine years in office, it has failed to challenge a law that may actually increase it. The problem is not just the abortion ban itself, which El Salvador shares in common with five other Latin American and Caribbean nations. Incidentally, those are the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Suriname, this is at least as of a few years ago. I'm not sure if it's changed since then. Continuing. What has made El Salvador unique on the international stage is the fanatical over-application of the law by police, prosecutors, and judges, and the complicity of many doctors fearful of standing on the wrong side of the law. An extreme law zealously over-applied. Abortion was made illegal in El Salvador in all circumstances in 1997. This was reinforced two years later by a constitutional amendment declaring that life begins at conception. Among the small number of countries that maintain a complete ban, only in El Salvador has law enforcement led to women being sent to prison for 30 to 40 years. To date, more than 150 women and girls have been prosecuted. More than 28 women are currently serving out cruelly long sentences. In the caption for the photo there, it says, In this December 2017 photo, Salvadoran Teradora Vasquez found guilty of what the court said was an illegal abortion via a miscarriage, arrives in a courtroom to appeal her 30-year prison sentence. The country's penal code mandates a 12-year sentence for women convicted of having an abortion, but if a miscarried or stillborn fetus is deemed viable by the courts, women are prosecuted for aggravated homicide. In one case, a 40-year prison term was handed to a woman who miscarried at 18 weeks. Many women jailed for miscarriages did not even know that they were pregnant. Women have been criminalized for obstetric emergencies because judges accept contradictory or non-existent evidence that they intended to either end the pregnancy or kill an early-term fetus. It is precisely the flimsiness of these cases that has enabled sentences to eventually be overturned, through strenuous efforts of organizations like the Citizens Coalition for the Decriminalization of Abortion. Harms to Health In addition to this clear violation of women's civil rights, the extremist application of the law imposes harms to health and life. For example, Salvadoran doctors have refused to intervene medically when a pregnancy endangers a woman's life, as in the case of ectopic pregnancy. This is when a fertilized egg becomes lodged in the fallopian tube, leading to rupture and lethal internal bleeding if untreated. So, comment there. Basically, the eggs are stored in the ovaries, which are small. They pass through the fallopian tube, which is also small, to the uterus. The uterus is the womb. It's where a baby grows. But the fallopian tube is tiny. If the baby starts growing there, it's just, it's not in the right place. You know, the uterus can expand. It's meant to accommodate a growing baby. The fallopian tube is not. It's just going to rip right through and go into all kinds of tissue that is not meant to accommodate it. Continuing, in such cases, doctors have stood by until the tube ruptures. This is just horrible medicine, and it's because of these reactionary laws. 
There are particular harms for very young girls and teens. Girls as young as nine years old have been denied therapeutic abortion. For these children, the trauma of sexual violence is compounded by the physical risks that childbirth poses to an immature body and the terror of going through with a dangerous pregnancy. Three out of every eight maternal deaths in El Salvador are pregnant teens who take their own lives. Let's say that again. Three out of every eight maternal deaths in El Salvador are pregnant teens who take their own lives. That's what this law causes. It is also known that 13% of maternal deaths in less developed countries are caused by unsafe abortions, which in turn become more frequent when abortion is illegal or unavailable. Hundreds of clandestine abortions certainly continue to occur each year in El Salvador despite the ban. Health ministry officials themselves acknowledge that the law and its application undermine their efforts to reduce the maternal mortality rate. Government employed doctors and poor women. What makes the situation all the more poignant is that it only affects the poor and poorly educated. These women and girls can't afford care in private hospitals and clinics where doctors maintain patient confidentiality, nor can they afford good legal counsel. Hand in hand with this class bias is most prosecutions of women for suspected abortion originate from doctors in state-funded public hospitals. Since the public system doesn't charge for services, it is the only option for low-income Salvadorans. It is also where there are more early career doctors who don't want to jeopardize their futures. These doctors fear that not reporting could be seen as assisting in an abortion, which for health professionals carries a penalty of 6 to 12 years. Prospects for change. Taken together, the deprivations of liberty and the physical and psychological suffering that have resulted from El Salvador's abortion regime have been labeled torture by Amnesty International. The outcome of the abortion struggle in the political arena is highly uncertain. On the one hand, almost 60% of Salvadorans now favor loosening the law when a woman's life is in danger, and fully 79% when the fetus is not medically viable. As well, a tentative coalition emerged, and I just have to say, 79% when the fetus is not medically viable? What's the other 21% thinking? You're not protecting a life in that case, anyway. As well, a tentative coalition emerged among legislators in late 2017 in favor of a bill by a maverick Nationalist Republican Alliance, or ARENA, party member, proposing that abortion be allowed in very limited circumstances. On the other hand, most of these lawmakers will be replaced on May 1, 2018, and ARENA overall remains staunchly opposed to any liberalization of the law. The party will have a large plurality of seats in the Legislative Assembly, dwarfing all the others. ARENA, moreover, has used abortion to villainize the FMLN, which has responded at times by sacrificing women's interests for success at the polls. But whatever legislators decide in the coming days, a broad social movement for fundamental justice on this issue has created momentum for change that will not likely subside. So that's the end of that article, and that is from a few years ago. The point is that this is a scenario where these laws just fully overtake the country. This is what it looks like. This is not a situation you want. So now let's close by checking back in with the case of Lizelle Herrera. This is an article from Teen Vogue from this past week titled, Abortion Advocates React to Lizelle Herrera's Arrest, Ready for Abortion Rights Fight. This is by Forteza Latifi. Kathy Torres was cleaning her house to prepare for her 26th birthday party when she found out that Lizelle Herrera, 26, had been arrested after Texas authorities accused her of, quote, intentionally and knowingly causing the death of an individual by self-induced abortion. Torres, who is an organizing manager with Frontera Fund, an organization committed to making abortion accessible in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, says, quote, her birthday paused and she spun into action to organize a community response to Herrera's arrest. Police arrested Herrera on April 7 after a call from hospital staff, resulting in her arrest for alleged self-induced abortion. The details of the alleged incident are unclear, but Herrera faced murder charges as a result. After protests organized by the Frontera Fund over the weekend, charges against Herrera were dropped, and since Gocha Ramirez, the district attorney in Starr County, Texas, said Herrera's arrest should have never happened, according to documents obtained by the Washington Post. Teen Vogue reached out to Ramirez for comment, but has not heard back. But before the charges were dropped, Torres and her colleagues jumped into action, 
ready to fight yet another step forward in the hasty erosion of reproductive rights in Texas. Shortly after Herrera's arrest, Torres and her colleagues contacted other pro-choice groups in the Valley like South Texans for Reproductive Justice and the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice. They hatched a plan to have community members and advocates report to the Star County Jail, where Herrera was being held on $500,000 bail. First thing in the morning on Saturday, half a million dollars bail. Twelve hours after celebrating her 26th birthday with her friends, Torres was at the Star County Jail with other pro-choice advocates where they chanted in support of Herrera, ate pan dulce, listened to music, and talked to assembled media. Quote, we were there, making noise, speaking, chanting, just letting the community know that we're outraged this happened, Torres says. And we were there, standing with Lazelle. That pressure is partially why Torres believes that the charges against Herrera were dropped. And while she's relieved that they were, she says the arrest never should have taken place in the first place. Quote, It's not just an oops, sorry, Torres says. Someone was wrongly incarcerated who shouldn't have been arrested in the first place. A bond was set so high based on a pregnancy outcome, and that sets a scary precedent. Ariana Rodriguez, a 24-year-old pro-choice activist and volunteer, said that she and other advocates were sounding the alarm before the passage of Senate Bill 8 the Texas ban that effectively outlawed abortion past six weeks and allows private citizens to sue anyone who, quote, aids or abets an abortion outside those strict parameters. Quote, we knew people were going to be persecuted for abortions, Rodriguez says. We were talking about how terrifying it would be, and people weren't listening. Lizelle Herrera had to get arrested for people to pay attention, which is unfair to her. While an upcoming Supreme Court decision could effectively overturn Roe v. Wade and outlaw abortion, Rodriguez says people in Texas are already living in a post-Roe world. Quote, People assume because we're a red state that we voted for these monsters, but we have so many voter suppression laws that put these people in power, she says. Don't write us off just because we're a red state. Maria Garcia, 18, is a member of the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice. The group calls its members poderosas, which means empowered, powerful women in Spanish. Quote, We see ourselves as powerful ones, Garcia says. She's been working with the group since 2020 and sees Organization for Abortion Access as critical to the region of the Rio Grande Valley, which is only miles from the U.S.-Mexico border. From Garcia's perspective, the closeness of the border, combined with the demographics of the Rio Grande Valley, whose population is 98% Hispanic, uniquely affects access to reproductive services. Quote, it's becoming increasingly hard with Senate Bill 8 for undocumented immigrants to get access to abortion, Rodriguez said. Because of all the border checks, it's so hard to go out of state to get an abortion. With the increase in abortion restrictions in Texas, Rodriguez points out that, quote, laws like this especially target black and brown women, disabled people, people with low income, or working class people. It's a structural issue to even get access to an abortion. Jimena Ortiz, 15, wasn't surprised either when Lizelle Herrera was arrested. Quote, I felt like it was bound to happen within Texas because our government is so obsessed with controlling people's bodies, they said. They say abortion is murder when it's not murder, it's health care. Ortiz started volunteering with the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice after watching their mom work for the Institute. Quote, All my life I've always been a part of it, they said. I wish people understood that I do know what I'm talking about. People talk down to me like I don't know, but I do. Despite the devastation of Herrera's arrest and what it may pretend for the future of reproductive justice in Texas, Ortiz says that they have hope that the younger generation of which they're a part will do the work to take the taboo from abortion. Quote, I hope it doesn't become a lifelong fight, Ortiz said, but if it does become a lifelong fight, I'm willing to put my time into it. So that's the end of that article, and I think that that's a really good note to end on. We as socialists need to be willing to put our time into this and every other issue affecting working class people. You know, I, at the end of most videos, will recommend to people, you know, learning about socialism online is a good thing. It's wonderful. You should do it. It's what this channel is exists to help out with and make more accessible. But at the end of the day, it's agitate, educate, organize. You got to join organizations. This doesn't just mean socialist political parties. Yes, try to find a political party that you can work within and that's doing good work. But beyond that, there are many types of mass organizations which can be organized around a variety of issues, and all of these are necessary as well. 
You know, there are hundreds of millions of working people in the United States, and not everybody's going to join a socialist political party. That said, people do need to be organized in various ways, whether it's labor unions or tenant unions or unions struggling for health care and reproductive rights. So when we say join an organization, all of this is fair game. Study your socialist history and theory, do your current events analysis, and then take it into the real world with you. On that note, I'm going to sign out. Thanks for listening. What do you think? Leave a question or comment in the comment section below. We'll continue the discussion there as always. Otherwise, thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. We don't run ads on this channel, so the Patreon supporters are hugely important in allowing me to spend a lot more time on this channel than I would have been able to do without that support, so much appreciated. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month. Every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful, so I really appreciate everyone for that. Beyond that, after the content has been created, engagement helps to boost it in the YouTube algorithm. That means liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting, even if it's just good video or thanks. All of that helps to boost the content in the YouTube algorithm and makes the content more accessible to people who might just be stumbling across it for the first time. Until next time, thanks again, and we will catch you in the next video.